everybody, welcome to my talk. I'm very excited to be here. I want to talk today about a few things. Firstly, for beginners, or those who want to start adventuring games as VFX artists, I wanted to talk about my mistakes, uh, about my failures, how I started and how I got here. And then for veterans and really for everybody, I wanted to talk about how I kept growing and stay motivated and passionate like on the first day of my job. And I also have some practical examples for you. Uh, what we would like to achieve in this talk is to inspire curiosity in you about all wonderful things uh, you can find and learn and how this can be applicable to your career and your job. And uh, I would also, also like to spark passion and love for what you do. A few words about myself. I'm a VFX artist uh, with 15 years of experience in games and currently I'm working at its Software on Doom Eternal uh, as lead VFX artist. And I have a short video uh, from uh, previous Doom, Doom 2016, of my work. I'm also a big fan of Tiny Potato Meme from Emily's Diary. So this Tiny Potato will accompany us through the presentation. I was born in Poland, country of potatoes, cabbage, and a lot of other good food. And as a child, I didn't have Barbies or Legos, but I have had crayons and colored pencils. And this is what I've been playing with. I was drawing uh, flowers, horses, and I loved drawing explosions. I got my first PC at 17, and I spent my life savings on it. And I was blown away by creative freedom in CG. At the time, it seemed to me limitless. And I created my first website. I worked on my first 2D game and first racing 3D game back in Poland. And I quickly realized that to get access to all the knowledge, I have to learn English. And uh, there was no online tutorials and, or internet as we know it now. So the books were the only source of knowledge for me. And they all were in English. This is one of my favorite and uh, first book I got for myself about VFX, uh, The Constructing the Elements by, by Pete Draper. And um, to do all the tutorials in the book, this book, I had to get myself a dictionary. And this is, this is how I went. This is how it started. And there are some other books I recommend for anybody who is or want to be a VFX artist. Um, my parents didn't want me to be a poor artist generally, so they didn't like that idea. So they sent me to a college that was miles away um, from my house to become a master engineer of environment protection science. Uh, but commuting time it was three hours one way, and that meant six hours a day I was sitting on a train. And I thought I could do so many cool things on my new computer if I only have time for that. So after a year, I transferred to a different college to save on time. And uh, uh, I studied uh, material, uh, material science instead. Uh, my parents didn't know about it because they were working shifts, so they didn't realize that I've been coming home a little bit earlier. And soon, I started uh, contracting and earning some money. So I was thinking, maybe I should drop off the school completely. Uh, but I didn't, and I'm glad I didn't because later on, higher education proved to be invaluable for immigration. Everywhere I went, starting with Engl England, Singapore, Canada, and United States, higher education was pretty much a requirement for me to get a job and live in those countries. 
Additionally, I convinced all my professors that I can do very good quality visualization of burning process in industrial stove, and they agreed for me this to be a big part of my master thesis, which was a lot of fun to do, actually. Um, Next day, after my master's thesis degree, I flew to England for my first serious interview for 3D generalist position. And I had my demo reel, but in my demo reel, I didn't have any of my contract work I did in Poland or even my master's thesis. I worked on a personal project for a while. I thought that was the better piece of art of anything else at the time I had. And I thought I had so much fun working on it because there was no restrictions on it. Nobody told me where was the deadline, there was no art, director, art direction, there was no uh, performance limitations or uh, strange tools. So it was great. And at the same time, I was learning English very hard for a few months to prepare for that interview. But it didn't go well. It went actually quite bumpy because I got so stressed, I completely froze, I couldn't say a word on, on that interview. And fortunately, my demo reel saved me and I still got hired. <laughs> and, and with that company, I shipped my first uh, AAA title and from there my doors were opening everywhere for me. Of course, it wasn't as simple as that. It was a lot of stress because I was still struggling with English, uh, learning new tools, proprietary tools and Maya. And uh, I felt like an idiot asking everybody for questions. And uh, giving and receiving feedback was terrifying because all artists were more experienced than me and they were all better than me. Um, and the only thing now, when I'm looking at it, looking at it from perspective, I know that I was stressed uh, because I was learning and growing. And that's, that's the process. Um, so first, I was hired to be a 3D generalist, but of all the things, I most wanted to make the effects. Uh, so I learned particle flow, fl fume effects, fluids in Maya, Krakatoa, thinking particles, reflow, you name it. Name it. Um, I did tons of training for film and CG because there was not much training for VFX for games at the time. And um, I was wondering how far I can push real-time VFX to look better, to look like in film, to look amazing. And I realized that one of the things uh, I, can, I have control over, regardless what set of tools I'm using, is the texture, um, especially if it's animated flipbook texture. Uh, when everybody else was using real footage to create animated flipbooks, I was rendering textures uh, from RealFlow and FumeFX simulations. I thought they are art directable and unique, so no other game would have the same fire as game I'm working on, which was great. Uh, I thought they are higher quality, noise free. I could render easily alpha mask or any other mask and maps. Um, and it was uh, much easier to retime if I needed them to have more or less flame, frames to play slow motion or faster. So I had a huge success with that. And then one day I got a dream job. Congratulations. And now what? So I was finally hired for a senior VFX artist uh, for amazing AAA title. I was excited, happy, and the world was just amazing at the time. Uh, because I got used to the pressure and fast-paced development, so I was pretty happy. But then with time, with a couple of years, especially during downtime, I got bored, and I grew more restless and frustrated. I was just thinking, I can't just make particles all the time. It's, it's, it's kind of boring, I'm kind of done with it. And I felt like I needed a challenge, but I didn't want to quit my job. So what I did, I took part in some CG competitions, uh, started doing more personal projects again, and uh, I learned new skills and software. And I also connected with other artists. And all that combined, meeting new people, learning new software, and starting new projects, it felt exactly like starting a new job, but without quitting the old one, which was fantastic. But then, at some point, I also took it too far. I shipped three three AAA titles in three years. That was great for my portfolio, but not good for my health and passion for games. Uh, I still wanted to do more, but I couldn't. Uh, looks like too much of anything, even a good thing, uh, can be a bad thing. This is why I wanted to talk about passion, workaholism, and burnout, and how can they be related. Firstly, passion is treated very seriously, seriously in games. It's part of the job description. 
um, I look closer at what actually means. And from many definitions from the internet, I pulled just two, just for contrast. Um, something that you are strongly interested in and enjoy sounds like a pleasant thing, but then strong and barely controllable emotion every day, all the time, is probably not the healthiest thing. And from my experience, there's no really bond between the two. And one can turn into the other at any time. So have some better metaphors. Passion is a powerful driving force. It can spark a fire in you that's often difficult to extinguish by sweat or battle. And passion is like ocean. It can take you far places, but it can also drown you if you don't respect it. And I made that one up. But the point is, the point is that Passion can be like a double-edged sword. It can help and it can hurt. So how do I deal with it? I'm trying to be careful how I fuel my, my passion. And it's like a hobby. So I would invest money and time in it, but I wouldn't, wouldn't invest all the money all the time because that would turn into obsession. And I need to know when to stop in time, to always get back to it excited the next day, not be tired and bored of it. Uh, I use Pomodoro technique to know when to take breaks from work. And I remember to work that work in entertainment industry supposed to be fun because if we don't have fun making games, then players will not enjoy playing them. Um, I think back to a uh, time when I started and what was exciting about my job back then because I feel still the same, t the same way about my job now. And I focus on what's important. Of course, this is much easier from manager perspective because I see now the bigger picture. And I prioritize and let go and come to terms uh, with the fact that artists never finish, just abandon when we run out of time. I try to work smarter, not harder. I'm trying to use all the knowledge, tools, and ask others for help if this is what makes my job more efficient. And part of this efficiency are procedural workflows. And this is when I heard about Houdini many, many years ago. But I started to learn Houdini just a couple of years ago just because it is very hard. Uh, most of you probably know this picture and think it's a great joke, but it's not. It's true. It's hard. <laughs> I also had to justify spending on expensive PC. And I thought about it as investment in my passion and career. And honestly, I wouldn't be here if I didn't get that PC a couple of years ago. Harder though, hardest though, was finding time in busy day-to-day -day living. And I started learning Houdini in the evenings after work and on weekends. And then I was looking for good sources of information. I started by joining side effects forums, odd forums, and uh, various Houdini Facebook groups. And from there, I found tons of uh, information, learning resources, and tutorials. But the best tutorials for me are those that are easy to follow and they don't take eight hours to complete. And there are a few examples. And Tag Master and Nipping, John Farmfield, Houdini Wiki. And people now ask me quite often, where do you start? What tutorials do I begin with if I want to learn Houdini? And I do send them those tutorials, the, the list on, from the previous slide. And some of those people do come back to me after a couple of months uh, with rendered images from those tutorials showing that they follow the tutorials. And that's a good start, but this is not where I would stop. Um, personally, when I learn, I need to apply the idea from a tutorial to some different concept, to a different scene or combine few ideas into another uh, completely unique scene. And that way, I'm sure it's something I can take also credit for. But also, it's good to take the same tutorial and take it further, add to it, plus it, change it a little bit. So this is one of the examples I have here for taking a tutorial further. And I started with this simple uh, tutorial from Entagma. It takes about five, 10 minutes. It's on Entagma Patreon from the, their um, VEX 101 series. And as a result, you get a lot of boxes that uh, spin. And as they spin, they create a nice uh, wavy motion. So I thought, how can I plus it? What else I can do with this? Uh, so I added another layer of noise on this and that already made the pattern more, more interesting. And then I thought, I don't want all my boxes to have the same color. Uh, I would like some boxes to be brighter, more glowy, uh, depending on, uh, like here, depending on uh, angle of the box and on, on the velocity, uh, uh, spin velocity. 
So at that point, uh, I changed the color of the boxes and uh, I did a test render and I realized it would be cool to have some additional smoke swirling around those boxes. And um, so I sourced smoke from the floor from under the boxes and I sourced velocity from the boxes themselves. And I simulated pretty standard simulation in DOPS in the Houdini dynamic operators. And uh, from there, I did another test render and I realized that my nice glowing bright boxes are covered by dark smoke, which wasn't that great. So I wanted the to make the smoke brighter where the boxes were brighter, but I didn't want to re-simulate the whole thing. So what I did, I scattered a bunch of points around the boxes, and um, I transferred, I uh, made volume uh, from attribute uh, to get uh, the density where the uh, points were red. And then I multiplied this new created volume with the volume from previously simulated DOP. And that gave me the same smoke, but only in areas where boxes were bright. And I renamed it to be heat. That way I could shade it as a fire and the smoke from the simulation I could shade, uh, density from the simulation I could shade as a smoke and that way I achieved the effect I wanted. Um, on the boxes I had the material uh, that as I mentioned, the red color was controlling the emissive and blue color diffuse and the material was reflective, refractive, had round corners, and I rendered the whole thing in 4K in Redshift. That was one of my first renders in Redshift, and I was very surprised how much harder it is rendered in 4K than HD. It was a very interesting experience. And I added Crazy Soundtrack by Tiny Cat Massage, and uh, that was the final result. So that was one of the first videos where we thought that the music matches uh, with visuals very well. And uh, after that, we wanted to take it further uh, with visuals and sound integration, uh, where we wanted the uh, visuals, animation, or particles to be completely audio reactive, triggered by sound. Uh, so I started by looking at this tutorial uh, by uh, Atom on Vimeo. Uh, he has a sphere and a box uh, uh, moving to a tune, uh, and he shows how to use chops, uh, channel operators, uh, curves uh, to modify them, to make them usable for animation, and this is the result you get. And then I also really like the technique by Spencer Lauders uh, from CG Workshops, Introduction to Effects Using Houdini. Uh, he shows how to dissolve an object into particles. It's a very cool technique he shows. So I wanted to combine those two and make something unique. And uh, what I changed here, I used MIDI instead of WAV files because I wanted to have access to separate nodes. I wanted more nodes, not just one or two, but I want to have five or six. Um, and I created separate emitter for each node and I spawned a particle from relevant emitter when node was happening. And I copied a sphere uh, to each particle and the size of the sphere was relevant to the amplitude of the node. And uh, this is how it, how it looked like at the start. And then, uh, I created second um, particle operator uh, network, second pop network to dissolve spheres on collision. And that part is exactly like in Spencer's tutorial. Um, I'm just adding uh, some additional velocity, custom velocity for particles so they go up uh, above the floor, not under the floor. But this is the final result. <laughs> So this is all going great, but I had to do some adjustments with my working routine uh, because it was very frustrating to walk away from a problem very late at night and uh, my head was still spinning to try to solve problem in Houdini when I was supposed to be asleep a long time ago. Um, so I had to limit learning Houdini to every second evening uh, and only part-time weekends. 
but I did save tons of time on rendering because we do have two computers at home and uh, my husband's computer is never used at night. Uh, so we start rendering every second frame to a network drive. The only problem we had was that we were drawing too much power uh, from our office room, so computers were randomly shutting down. This is why. <laughs> This is why we had to get this uh, really nice, thick, uh, long yellow cable to draw power from another room. And after that, it was working perfectly fine. And on the evenings when I was not uh, working on Houdini, I started painting. And that actually proved to be a much more relaxing activity before going to bed. So where do I take the ideas from? Really, sky is the limit. Anything. Art station, Instagram, Pinterest, dreams, films. And I keep a list of ideas to pull from. Uh, I start with a simple idea because if the idea is too complex, it's less likely uh, to, project is less likely to be finished and the message is less likely to be conveyed for a viewer. Um, uh, but I don't start with the first idea because the first idea is usually in the most boring one. So I try to add to it, uh, plus it, twist it, change it a little bit. And sometimes I even try to tell a story. And of course, there's a question, do you need to model, rig, animate, and make all those assets to make actually like a scene, especially if it's like a storytelling? And the answer is not always. I looked what other artists do, and this is one of my favorite artists, uh, Renderburger, you can find him on Instagram, and he does a lot of cool videos. And uh, this little animation, uh, model and animation surely are uh, procedural, and uh, it's a nice little idea. You can also get uh, free models from uh, freediscounts.com, and that's just one of the websites where you can get them. This is where I got this uh, little dragon from. And uh, yeah, those, those, the quality of those models is really, really good. You can do a lot with them. Um, and you can also buy very, very cheap models. I mean, sometimes five, ten dollars from CG Trader or Unity. Many times they come animated, rigged, animated. And um, I don't exactly know where Renderburger took this head model from, uh, but the point is not about the head. The point is about the idea and caption, which is mind blowing. And also, if you want to. Um, if you know people who want to upgrade their skills as animators or modelers, it's a very good idea to team up. Um, so when working on a project, I implement ideas fast to see what has potential. And I move to the next concept if something doesn't spark or if it's technically too hard. Um, if I can't get it done because uh, I'm discouraged in any way or it goes too slow, I might stop. And the point is to keep going, keep progressing. Um, so for example, this uh, shot I made just in a couple of days because the previous idea I've been working on uh, for weeks uh, was just technically too hard. And I might come back to it at some point when I know more about it. So how do I know when the project is finished if no one tells me when is the deadline? Uh, I'm trying to focus on what's important. Uh, I fix only five to 10 things from my first test render and I'm trying to finish one project a month. If I can't deliver something clever or sophisticated in that time, I render something simple. And rendering does take time, unfortunately, and definitely teaches patience. And none of those projects ever feel ready or good enough to be shared online. But I know that the perfection is the enemy of done, so at some point I need to uh, move on. And the goal at this point is to progress and learn, not to make something sophisticated. Of course, feedback loop is part of the learning. Uh, this is why it's important to share the work. As Meg Black said, the work of art is not complete until it's shared. And you will be surprised what people respond to. There's nothing frustrating, more frustrating than uh, trying to solve a problem that I used to have in the past but not remembering how I did it. This is why I take tons of notes, and you can find my notes on GitHub. And uh, I, keep, I keep all the old files, and I make the same setup, sometimes multiple times, to remember. I also make shelf tools, presets, and HDAs to uh, recreate setups quicker. Uh, this is also why Houdini is such a great visual learning tool, because it's not just easier to debug, but also easier to memorize. And I have here another example to show you that learning math in Houdini can be a lot of fun. 
So the idea here was that I wanted to create a procedurally a circle, just using attribute wrangle and points and connect them and make a circle. So this is the equation that let me do it. And that was cool, but I was thinking, what would happen if I start modifying this equation and changing things in it? So I got that when I multiplied x and y position by angle. I got spiral. And then when I added changing variable, like a time to it, uh, I got animation. And instead of multiplying when I add to uh, x component, I got a wave and this <laughs> and that. And the point is that there is no such thing like math polys. Playing with equations and changing variables and numbers and just seeing what happens is a lot of fun. So how is this all relevant? For me, projects in Houdini branched into learning other software. Speedtree, Redshift, Substance, Megascans, GitHub, Nuclino, and much, much more. Learning logic, math, and scripting improved my technical skills. Debugging and solving problems taught me patience and critical thinking. Uh, I learned how to divide complex problems into smaller chunks and tons more. But the good thing is it only got easier from start. How growing makes me happy, happier. Uh, I feel that I'm becoming a better artist. I like the satisfaction and the feedback loop. I feel like I'm staying current with new technologies and techniques, which is very relevant to any AAA developer. I'm widening horizons. It's easier for me to connect with others from different disciplines. It's easier for me to talk with animators, programmers, designers, or lighting artists. I'm finding things I like, like motion design, abstract CG, and music videos, which I would, wouldn't have a chance to discover otherwise. So next time you have some time, see what other artists do, what excites you and inspires you. Open your favorite software or software you're not familiar with and play with it. Maybe you even like it. Personal projects are on your rules. You are an art director. You're deciding what to do, how to do it, and in what time frame. Nourish your passion, never stop learning, and help others to grow. And remember, Tiny Potato believes in you. You can do the thing. So I wanted to thank everyone who believed in me, especially my husband, Sean, uh, Mark Tier for invitation to talk at GDC, and entire team at Eat Software for support. Thank you. I'm also supposed to remind you to fill out this survey after we finish with this presentation. Thank you. <laughs> if anybody has questions, do we have time for questions? Five minutes? Okay, yeah, we can have some questions then. Anybody? Anybody? No? No? I have a question. Do you have times that you like to design, like are you, do you design at night or in the morning or do you set certain parameters for yourself? Uh, yeah, I try to make it a habit uh, generally. It's, it's, it's very hard to make it uh, like at random times, I would say. So uh, lately it's been like every second evening. So I would do it, you know, like Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, and then uh, on the weekends for four hours a day. Uh, and generally with the ideas, I don't spend too much time thinking about them. I mean, I have a list of ideas, but they're very rough. It's just whatever I watch on the internet or movie, I just put on my phone and it's just like few sentences saying what the idea would be. And then when it comes to doing it, actually, I'm trying to implement it roughly really fast. So if I'm afraid that, well, I don't know if I can pull it off technically, I try to start with technical side. And if I can't pull it off, then yeah, I either have to ask somebody for help or drop it and try it later. And if I'm worried about, well, can I pull it off how it would look like actually, this is where I would start. Then I would just you know, create camera, whatever I need to see in the camera and see like, is this actually working from those angles? Are people going to be able to understand what I'm trying to show here? And uh, yeah, again, like if it doesn't work, I move on very fast. Those videos I make, this is maybe, I don't know, like one fourth of the ideas I'm working on, but many of them I just drop or never finish uh, because I don't know how. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned keeping track of all the stuff you're trying to remember mm -hmm. via GitHub. 
I was curious, is that like uh, shared or is that a private thing for you to? Uh, it's a, I mean, it's a my GitHub account, okay. but it's, a, it's completely sh shared. You can get access to it, just Google it and you find it. Right. Yeah, you, you will see all my notes with all the grammar mistakes and everything, it's all there, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, my other question is, where did you find t Tiny Cat Massage music? Oh, <laughs> that's my husband. He sits oh, right okay. here. Okay, I figured it had he, to be somebody you knew. It's he great. Makes music I love music, for, too. Yeah, he makes music for all my videos. <laughs> yes, that's right. And yeah, it's, uh, his music is, uh, I think, on iTunes and, and everywhere. You can definitely find it. Hello. Hi. So I was always interested in Houdini, but I never started uh, to learn this piece of software. And I'm wondering uh, the level of math required to be successful in using Houdini. It, it all depends. So some people, for example, use only shelf tools, and you can be pretty successful with that. But it's the same, for me, it's the same like when I was using Max and Maya, because I know both. And I will be using Max, and I will be like doing something cool with particles and destruction. And at some point, I'll get stuck. Like I can't, for example, instance lights to particles. You know, like something crazy like that. I want to do it. I can't do it. And I can't do it without some crazy Python scripting thing. And I find that actually in Houdini, yeah, you will get stuck if you use shelf tools. And at that point, you do want to know something more about it. Uh, but it's actually easier, because you don't have to know Python. It's, it's easier to find out what you need to do to achieve this kind of thing. So I find myself less stuck in Houdini. And the, the only thing that limits me is you know, my knowledge about how to do it. And there's a huge community. And I never seen anybody you know, get stuck for a long time. People usually answer questions when you post to forums and so on. So it's, it's very easy to get unstuck from things like that if you really need it to be done. Okay, basically because uh, you mentioned several pieces of software uh, to learn and uh, to be successful, and I know that there's a limit. You can't learn everything, but you mentioned you know both Max and Maya, which is not too common, I think. So uh, starting to learn, <clears throat> um, let's say Houdini, which mm -hmm. is quite uh, yeah. Um, it's hard, hard to learn. Yeah, so it's hard. I'm wondering if, if it's possible to uh, learn this uh, software um, because I'm a, more of a modular guy, asset uh, work in asset creation. Mm -hmm. So in your personal opinion, is it possible to do both and be good at these things? Or using Houdini requires the whole attention of the of, uh, people. <clears throat> So with creation of assets, there's another thing uh, that if, if, if in company you're working and you have like a technical artist who knows Houdini, they can create tools for you uh, to use in Maya or Max uh, or even in a uh, game engine you're working in uh, that you don't need to know like everything what happens behind the scenes, behind the curtains, all the math. Uh, you just get sliders that are relevant to you. It's a similar thing like rig riggers and animators. Riggers provide a rig and animators just use the rig to create animation. And uh, that's a that's completely valid way of working, and, and many studios do that, that they have only a few people who know Houdini from inside out to create those HDA assets. And then um, everybody else, you know, modelers, uh, animators, everybody else can use those assets to create ivy, to create buildings, uh, but they don't have to know inside out everything about it. OK, thank you very much. Bye. <clears throat> Hello, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I've seen you don't use compositing at all in your workflow. Is it because it's a um, home setup, or is it for you, in your opinion, too much when you're working alone to try to integrate this kind of pipeline? You, you mean real flow? Compositing workflows when you oh, run down the workflows. passes. Sometimes it can, you, can, you can get more flexibility to re rework lighting, colors without re-rendering everything? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for those videos I create, I uh, use just After Effects, and I do use um, filters, of course. And uh, it does help, but I don't render multiple um, layers or like anything like that. Shadow maps to try to relight your renderings. Yeah, I, I, usually, I usually, because Redshift is so fast, uh, I usually just yeah. rely whatever it gives me out of the box. Uh, and 
you know, save on time that way. <laughs> because I, I'm trying to still mainly focus on learning Houdini. And of course, composing is a whole new area to learn. And I did that in past in Maya or Max when I was running V-Ray. Uh, V-Ray does give very, very good, you know, layers and you can composite it later. Uh, it's, it's a great workflow, definitely. Uh, but with Redshift, I'm, I'm just rendering pretty much as it is. And then I just use filter to correct the colors and it's done. I don't composite anything else on top. And you know, it's much harder if you, if you, if you do a lot of work with a transparency, like a fluids plus particles, and you want you know, motion blur on top of that, and trying to composite this, this is like advanced class for me. So I would need to uh, you know, look up some tutorials for that, definitely. Yeah, you can do pretty nice things. Thank Thanks. you. Cool. All right. Thanks very much, everybody.